Today, for the first time, Jeff Bolski on the podcast. Super excited. He recently played the Triton series and how this end and a lot more we're talking about on the stream. Also about his infamous 10-10 hand against Ike Hexton and his routines and how he's grinding and hard working right now. Probably the hardest working poker player, poker streamer out there right now. So lots of value, lots of stories. I hope you guys enjoyed. If you have any questions, drop it in the comments. Don't forget uh, to hit that subscribe button. We're about to hit the 100,000. Thank you so much, guys, for the support. Now let's get right into the content and hope you guys enjoy it. Mr. Bowski, the man himself, today here joining me on the podcast. Welcome. How's it going? NCB, always a pleasure. Glad to be on the podcast. Finally, a lot of a lot of epic guests you've had. I'm I'm glad to be part of the list. Yes, uh, happy to have you here. How are things going after your massive Triton success? Let's get right into it. So for those of you guys not watching, uh, ACR did a great promo that I was also showing support on Twitter. You had a certain challenge to complete and three streamers from the stream, tree, stream team then were selective to go to the Triton and you got like a 100k package. So basically $100,000 reward for a streamer uh, in buy-ins, flights, everything covered worth hundred thousand dollars right that's correct yeah quite the promotion acr put on uh long month month-long competition of grinding micros uh promoting acr on socials and growing your acr channels and a heads-up competition all getting uh different points for each competition and let me tell you what a grind what a grind really push a lot of people's limits and it just felt great to come out and on top number one uh, and top three went, and it was a trip of a lifetime. How was the trip to Triton? Talk us through. F flight, first class, private jet, yeah. business class. What was, what was the part of the package? Yeah, the package was 100K in buy-ins, uh, however you wanted to spend it. Uh, business class from wherever nice. you are um, and hotel paid. So business class. Much business more class is really economy. good, man. Yeah, uh, it was uh, my first time ever flying business class, really. And quite the difference. They treat you like a king compared to a peasant in, in economy. You got, you're either sitting in your pod by yourself, <laughs> laying flat, you can fall asleep. The food's actually good. And there's not, there's the best service you can imagine. Uh, super, super polite. Um, I even got promoted to first class on the way there from my business class. I didn't even think it'd get any better. So I had just my own pot, like no one even near me, first row, um, just treated like a king. And yeah, that was just very, very important for me because uh, being 6'5", 210 pounds, it, very awkward, you know, traveling coach for any number of hours. And historically, I've had a real bad fear of flying. Um, not, not like a fear of being up in the air. That didn't really, not like fear of heights, just the process and just being trapped and just like freaking out in my mind. Um, so being able to be in business class really did make a world of a difference. And I, I really appreciate that opportunity because I never even, I've never even been to Europe. I'm 39 years old. I've never flown across the pond. Um, and to just go all the way to Vietnam was a huge leap. How long was the flight? Uh, well, there, luckily there was only one stop um, from Vegas to Seoul and Seoul to Da Nang. So like 13 hours from Vegas to Seoul a layover, a few hour layover, and then uh, like five hours from Seoul to, to Da Nang. So maybe 18, 20 hours total flying in the air without, you know, airport. Yeah, bullshit. wow, sick. So like a full day of traveling, right? Oh yeah, and then some, and just, but sleeping on the plane, never really thought I could do it, but when you can lay flat down, yeah, yeah. put a little blanket on you, and <laughs> just peace and quiet, it's pretty nice. Yeah, I can imagine. How was the hotel? Was the how was the whole experience being there? The venue, a uh, very nice venue. Uh, really cool to hang out with all the high rollers and just get a feel for you know their lifestyle and how they just travel to all these all the time. And um, yeah, the buy-ins all all comp from ACR. I didn't have to bring any money. It's all digital, uh, crypto or whatever. And yeah, nice activities in a very nice hotel right on the right on the ocean there. Um, yeah, no, no complaints, excellent service. Uh, everybody is very nice. So I, I really don't have anything really bad to say. Just, uh, a vac vacation, high stakes tournament destination. Triton really puts on a great show. Nice. I'm happy to hear that. How was it playing against the big boys? 
when it uh, how, how was always especially the first hands like did it long were you nervous like did you also do any kind of preparation like in terms of live tests and stuff i mean we you and i we had a session before and i, I told you some things how i would approach it but like just in general if you if you can talk us through walk us through on everything yeah there i definitely asked a lot of people how there's the meta game of how all the high stakes pros would uh, would view me and how they'd play against me so how i could counter that uh, you gave me a lot of great information that i, I really appreciate as to um, just in general, how that, how would they, how they would play against me. And I think I did a good idea, a good job of not, not playing scared, not just trying to get min caches. And I, I kind of envisioned me sitting down with, you know, Adamo, Bonamo, Ike, Jacoon, and like, I know Jacoon, but I don't know if these other guys really know who I am from like YouTube or anything. And I just imagined them just interrogating me just hey what's up man you know like this fake interrogation like oh where are you from oh how long have you been playing poker and it's like just trying to suck every inform every piece of information out of me um but it wasn't like that at all like they barely they didn't bother me it's like they just let me play if i wanted to talk to them they talked to me you know it wasn't they, they didn't act all high and mighty like they were better than me or anything like that so it was uh very refreshing and very comfortable just playing my game and just I wasn't too intimidated by them at all. I just, just another tournament. It's just chips. I'm just trying to win all the chips. And um, I, I had a real good idea just from watching uh, like top pros like you on, on Twitch and the training videos and stuff, just how they approach the game and the, the sizings and the ranges. So I, I could really put them on a, a real good range, like based on board textures and positions and everything, uh, just because I know what what the right way to play is like the gto um what the solvers say and that's just how they play just a balanced solver approach and it's like their sizings are almost predictable in a lot of spots just i mean the basic stuff you know three bet pre ace high board you bet small you know wet board you bet bigger in these spots and stuff and uh yeah just not not very intimidated and um just a very very exciting uh wasn't bored i'll tell you that i wasn't on my phone scrolling through twitter <laughs> I'm happy to hear that. So you, how many tournaments did you play in total? Uh, well, I got there late. Unfortunately, the E visa was not cleared on time and they wouldn't let me go to Vietnam. I went to the airport and the Korean air said, no, we can't even let you leave, which was messed up because I heard like I could just get it approved when I land in Vietnam, but they're yeah. adamant. They're like, no, we can't even let you on this flight. So I had to wait. I, I was sweating the E visa the whole time and people just told me just go. And they're like, no, you can't go. You, you want to just go to Vietnam and get rejected and have them send you back? Could you imagine how tilting that would be? Um, so I had to wait three days later. So I missed like the GG 25K opening event and a few other like 15, 20Ks. But when I got there, right when I got there, there was a 20K uh, mystery bounty that I late regged. And then the next day, a 30K, the next day, a 50K. So 20, 30, 50, 100,000 in buy-ins and... I thought I thought the trip was over, but it wasn't over yet. <laughs> Why not? Um, a few days after the 50K, uh, I was just hanging out, was uh, having breakfast with people, and we did this yoga class, which was uh, pretty nice, just right outside. Um, and I went back to my room and was about to take a shower, and I was like, well, there's a 25K today. I mean, what if I could sell 90%? I mean, is that ridiculous? I'm, I'm down to put 2,500 into this bad boy. I, I bet enough of my friends will buy 90% of this. So I put it on Twitter and, and messaged a few friends. I was like, I'm, I'm here. I might as well play. Um, and as soon as I got out of the shower, I got a message from uh, the coordinator at ACR and said, why are you selling action on Twitter? I was like, why not? I'm allowed to sell action on Twitter. <laughs> she goes, no, the Phil, the CEO, is putting everybody in the 25K turbo. I was like, oh, shit. Okay. So Phil put me and the other pros in on just a 25% free roll, which you just can't turn that down. So that yeah. was a, a nice present. <laughs> nice. And that, that, that uh, played well and ran, well de ran very deep in that one and some uh, exciting hands, as you know, with uh, yeah. Mike Hacks. Yeah, you made a great call where a lot of people would just try to fold their way into the money. I saw it on Twitter, like most would advocate for a fold. Um, but it's a clear call, right? Uh, maybe we can display it somewhere here. 
the hand was a pretty sick hand, pretty good call. You held right, running into king queen or queen jack. It was a coin flip, big sweat, eh? Yeah, uh, uh, Ike was chip leader at our table. We've been hand for hand on the money bubble. Uh, 16 left, 15 pay. I'm um, in cash is forty four thousand um, dollars. One of the biggest cashes of my life. If I just win <clears> cash, it's yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, and I'm like middle middle stack, one million chips, about uh, twenty big blinds effective, and he's just open jamming almost every hand as he should, keeping the pressure on. And I remember uh, it was so weird because I didn't really say anything the whole time, but the previous hand he jammed, and I kind of jokingly said, "Wow, getting a lot of good hands there, Ike." And he just kind of laughed and the table laughed because they all know, you know, they know what's going on. And the very, and then I was like, I thought to myself, I said, what would I call with? And like, I had a premonition, I had jacks and I was like, ugh. <laughs> and then the very next hand he shoves and I looked down at tens. I'm like, wow, well, it was worse than jacks, but it's still a pretty good hand. And I had eight time banks and I used seven of them, which uh, kind of gives away the strength of my hand because there's still like, people behind me but <laughs> i needed to yeah. make the right team. and i was watching the other table to see if anybody busted and no one busted and the camera all the camera crews were around just shooting videos and taking pictures of me in this moment i was like oh man just more stress and <laughs> feel everyone rooting for me to call and lose you know to get that get the yeah. money but i was like man if i i just ran the simulation of if i call and win i'm now going to be the chip lead at the table with position on ike so then the amount of chips i can gain before the bubble burst is going to be pretty damn good so there's that extra equity there and if i call and lose you know so be it at least i went out swinging and i but i know just like deep down like, don't call just don't call on bubbles icm just never calling's horrible shove yeah um, and i eventually just pulled the trigger and uh, i was very upset to see two overs i thought his range was so fucking wide to see yeah, King yeah. Queen, i was like wow not a flip <laughs> i didn't didn't think it'd be a flip at all like ace deuce six seven suited you know king five suited but no uh he had uh he had the overs and the board ran out clean and we got that double and the rest is history <laughs> yeah it's actually a pretty sick spot and um to be honest i think we sh you saw the results that I was posting on Twitter and uh, I was even making YouTube video around it because it's a spot that a lot of players really do misplay and have the same approach of, oh, just, you know, trying to get into the money. But ICM is always a consideration of what you can risk and what you can gain. So you're going to be a lot tighter there as a 10 or 15 big blind stack because by doubling up, you're not gaining that much. But when you, you had 20 big blinds or how many, how many big yeah, about 20 bigs. 20 yeah, bigs. Now doubling up, you're basically risking the same in all of these scenarios busting out of the tournament, bubbling when someone covers you. But now you really gain massive um, a massive benefit from, from doubling up where you're essentially going to have a final table stack already. Um, and there's so much future gain, future game. And ICM understands that now against a really wide range, I mean, with 10s, we're just crushing most of his hands. Um, we should never be dominated. He will always induce with jacks plus, um, even ace king, ace queen suited. It's really just like ace jack off, king queen off. That really sucks. Um, that's basically already suck out a bad beat for you that you run into king queen. You know, uh, ninety percent of the time you're gonna have 60, 65, 70, 80 percent equity. You know, it's like having fifty five percent is literally the worst case scenario. Um, so especially in smaller fields on the on the bubble you you call off a lot wider than you would do on larger fields because now imagine you're a thousand players left doubling up like it's not so big because the next page jump is 100 away but usually when the bubble is at 15 paid you're gonna have a page jump at 13 12 and just doubling up from 20 to 40 you're almost guaranteed like a top seven top six payout especially in a turbo format where you have a bunch of 5 10 50 big blind stacks and it's just busting like flies and you can even build your chip stack further. So when when you're even second, third, fourth in chips and someone jumps into you, very often you see pocket eights call, pocket nines call. Um, and you really risk here um, bubbling, even though you would make it 100% of the time into the money if you would just fold. But the upsides are just huge. Where And that's probably where a lot of players struggle with uh, not having the deep runs and they may make a lot of min caches and maybe final tables and eight and nines. 
but they're really not making these top three placement finishes or tournament wins as often as they're supposed to because they're too tight and too scared. And it's it's minus EV. It's not even something where I'm just exploitatively. Like this is what the math, the theory teaches you. You will play a less profitable strategy in the long term if you keep making these folds. So I was really proud of you that you found this fold in the first place. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, it had to really reach deep down. And we have M Matthias Eibinger sitting uh, two to my right with three and a half blinds. Yeah. And he's just ready to lose. You know, there's five blinds, there's eight blinds at the other table. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, but like you said, that I think it was great when you uh, responded to, you made that post on Twitter about, uh, yeah, ICM matters, but putting yourself in a position to win a tournament matters too. Sure, yeah. min caps do add up, but you're sacrificing so much by playing too tight on bubbles. And I think you made a great point about the difference in bubbles. A lot yeah. of people don't think about the size of the field and the strength of the field yeah. um, when it comes to gambling on the bubble in the future game scenario. Yeah. And also typically that is very important. And that's actually a huge, 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 huge factor uh, when it comes to larger fields. Very often you have a lot more players playing the money bubble, meaning they're going to be on average more weaker opponents who have no clue about ICM who will do mi more mistakes. So the bubble will bust a lot faster than let's say in this field where most of the players are ICM aware will make better decisions. I'm not saying they play; they still do plenty of mistakes, but just comparing these two fields that in a small field, I'm willing to make a lot more of these ICM punts that are still uh, perceived ICM punts by majority that are still profitable calls. Um, maybe they're a tiny bit more marginal. I would fold those in larger fields because the bubble busts faster on average, a lot faster. Uh, people do major mistakes and you're not benefiting that much from doubling up. So they are making more adjustments and even calling two pips, three pips tight are very often spots where you're supposed to call ace 10. I might only call ace king plus or spots where it's ace queen plus and nines plus. I'm literally calling queens plus. Um, so I'm making much bigger adjustments because I know that in reality, actually folding is a lot more profitable than ICM understands because it cannot consider the 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 um, skill level for, uh, of the players of the average player in this field and that's usually a lot weaker and you make it in the money a lot faster so you're not suffering by folding like in smaller fields very often you reach the bubble it's like 15 16 left 15 paid in your situation imagine you don't have a three for five big blind stack you know the short stacks are also playing a lot smarter they understand just one double up they're back in the mix they're not going to be super loose the mid stacks are not punting it off um so very often you have five big blinds and post bubble you have five big blinds. Awesome. Then you bust the next 10, you know, um, but in larger fields, the bubble busts a lot faster. So you're not bleeding out that much. Very often you reach the, the bubble with 20 big blinds. You survive the bubble with 80 big blinds, you know, it's like just, all right, just fold one or two hands. You're in the money. That's, that happens a lot more than, than a short field. But I had crazy uh, small field bubbles where we played for a fucking hour and I reached the bubble. I remember one 5k main was like, I think 74 left and 73 paid or some shit like this. 5K main. We played for an hour. I think I reached the bubble with like 30 big blinds and ended, survived the bubble with six big blinds or some shit like this because the short stacks keep du kept doubling. But the smaller the field, um, the, more, the more likely that this can happen. And this is something you need to consider as well when you have the opportunity to double up from 20 to 45 big blinds or 40 big blinds. So uh, it's, a huge, it's, 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 a, it's a huge league from, for many players. Yeah, people don't understand the rate of attrition is so much greater in a bigger field. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just bad, you know? Yeah. A thousand person field, a hundred pay, you know, you're going to go from 102 to a hundred in two hands. Yeah. But a hundred person field, 10 pay, you're at 11, you know, here's hand for hand. You can be there, like you said, yeah. an hour, no problem. Yeah. So that's a very important concept that uh, people need to you know, keep in mind. Yeah. Do you want to share how how this trip ended for you overall? I mean, you didn't have to pay any of the buy-ins, right? So, what was the what was the total profit for you from that trip? Uh, yeah, it was a it was a great trip. Um, another another nice uh, part of the promotion um, on America's Card Room that Phil Nagy put on was if you want a package in their two thousand six hundred and fifty dollar uh, mega satellite to the hundred K, they ran a, a couple of those super saddies. I think four four or five people qualified for that three team pros and one ACR stormer. So I think we had 10 total qualifiers from ACR alone. He offered to buy anybody's action up to 50% at face value. Yeah. So if you want, you won the package, you're playing hundred K in buy-ins, you can sell directly to him, uh, whatever you feel comfortable with, just so you can have guaranteed profit. Um, and I, I took that option. I sold 50% of the hundred K 
Um, so I've got 50K right there. Uh, Phil had 50%. Unfortunately, I bricked those three events. And like I said, Phil gave us a free Well, roll. luckily when you saw it action, because technically you wouldn't have won any money. So now you still made 50K, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it can go both ways. For sure. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, I shouldn't have sold that. Yeah, but, yeah, of course. Know, like, you can't be results oriented, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I won. I ended up getting seventh place. Spoiler, spoiler alert. Uh, I got seventh place in the uh, the turbo. And uh, won biggest live cash in my life, $121,000. Um, so $30,000 of that was profit straight profit so i've walked away with about eighty thousand dollars from the trip after bricking three events and getting seventh in the 25k turbo which uh, brings up a point i actually mentioned on twitter which kind of irks me like when people ask you oh uh hey ben how, how'd you do in that 100k oh i want to i want a million dollars uh if you sell action do you really say that like on paper um you know yeah. it's it's weird because, you know, people in the know or people look at your handed mob is like, oh, this guy won eight, has 8.2 million in winnings. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, he might be down a million. <laughs> you know, it yeah. doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah uh, I just sure. wonder what, what the correct answer is when people ask, oh, how'd you do in the WSOP main? Oh, I won 142,000. But I had a uh, 20% swapped out. I was a 50K in makeup. I mean, yeah. I usually. <laughs> the the only thing that I communicate is that people know that I'm selling some action for 25Ks online. The rest I'm not. Uh, and if okay. that happens, let's say, if I'm down, I, I, I sometimes had Sunday sessions where I'm down 150K because I was playing 25Ks. Like usually when I'm down, I could technically also say I'm not down 150K, I'm down only 100K. But I'm not doing this. So I'm not using, using it for both instances, either losing or winning. If I'm winning, I'm also not saying, yeah, I only had... I don't know, 70, 60, 50 percent of my action. But the same I'm also doing for my losses. I think it would be a bit weird if you try to make your whole appearance or um, performance artificially look better by say by not mentioning, "Hey guys, I won a million, but I only maybe at 10 percent." Um, so you're not saying anything there, but then you bring it up when you lose. Yeah, I lost 200k, but you know, I only lost 20k because I sold 90 percent of my action. So that gives a false perception that's like, ah, he's losing 20K there, 50K there, but then he'll want a million. You know, it's like, no, he actually just won 100K. You know, then it puts things a bit more into perspective. I think if you don't want to say anything, then don't say anything. If you want to be open about how much you really lost and you really won, then you should do it both ways. That's that's how I see it. Yeah, you got to be consistent. Yeah, Be consistent. Yeah, otherwise you're creating false perceptions of you, how, how you really perform. Yeah, it's like, oh, I cashed for 250K. That's it. Yeah. Or yeah, I cash for 250k and and as always, I only had half my action. So Yeah. I I mean this this is a different mm -hmm. topic. I don't know how you see it, but um this whole narrative around coaches, school sharing their profits. Like I never really have a problem with that. I'm curious how you how you see it and I think nobody should judge for it, but what I do have a problem with is uh if there then there are some people and coaches that say I have like 10 million in winnings. No. Mm -hmm. You fucking idiot. You have five, ten, ten million caches. And yeah. I think they do it on purpose. I don't want to call out any names, but it's caches. And you're you're misleading your followers, your fans, whoever, on purpose. You know exactly what winnings means. You know, it's not your winnings, it's caches, it's revenue, it's turnover, however one you want to use it. Yeah, that's what I was kind of getting at with Hend and Mob and people, you know, saying, oh, yeah, I'm a live pro, 5.2 million in winnings. Like, and, you know, the recreational would be like, wow. Yeah. You're rich. You're killing it. Like, ah, actually, I'm yeah. break even. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you, you posted a shark scope graph recently, right? <clears throat> yeah. I mean, it has been leaked, I think, a couple of weeks early already. And I think it was open for some days. Someone leaked it on my stream. So I think it was already pretty known, to be honest, at least for stars. Most of it, and I didn't never really care. I mean, I've never posted. I had these results now for more than 10 years. And uh, if you look at how many games I play, you know roughly what I made last year, or the last two, two years, if you people really want to dissect it. Um, so the, the, the problem I just had with the transparency is um, that people, uh, again, I, I, don't, I don't judge anyone. Someone, hey, I offer a poker coaching or whatever, but I don't want to share my results. 
I don't care. I think it's fine. I think it's reasonable. Uh, maybe someone uh, values his, his privacy a lot more and, and doesn't care, then it's already disadvantage enough. Let's say I, I had a massive disadvantage not sharing this for many years, but I never really cared. Um, but now we, we, we truly believe that we really know what systems work in poker. And it's, of course, also a supporting message that, hey, you know, I'm streaming, I'm playing 20, 25 tables, and we know how to beat poker, especially since I grinded, grinded my way up from $1 limits. I know how to beat every single stake. Um, and yeah, this is just on a side note that I find it very problematic the way people are using these terms. And you can't tell me that it's like, oh, I didn't know what winnings means. I thought it mean. I think I thought people know it means cashes. No, you know exactly what it means. I think it's good that you share results, you know, good or bad, especially if you're, you know, big of a part of a big coaching site or anything like that. You, it should just be transparent against because that's important to I can see if you if you're not a, a public figure, it's nobody's business. Yeah. But if, if that's your game and you're coaching and you're just a huge lifetime loser, that's a big red flag. And I know people in chat were like, have even said, hey, Ben, let's see the graph. Let's see the graph or whatever. How are you doing? Yeah. Or even having like the lie, I know on your stream, a lot of people don't like to do this, but they have like the, the number of buy-ins and the number of winnings. And it's, I think it's a really cool thing to have just so people get a feel of how much you put in before you get that big win at the end of the session, or mm -hmm. you just lose down, you just end up being down a lot. Yeah. But the, the trolls that don't, don't understand, will be like, oh man, this guy's down 50 K he's horrible. You know, he's always down. Why is he always down? Well, that's how tournaments work. Yeah. You just don't wake up reg a bunch of tournaments and be up yeah. <laughs> and then it streams over once you get that big win you're up you're up 50k for five minutes yeah and the stream is over yeah so i think that's a nice thing that you have on your stream that a lot of people don't have but i get why some people don't have it just because of the negativity it will bring of people being like man this guy's always losing he's always down how, how does he win yeah. it's like a if they don't understand you know no of course no i understand your point and I definitely see both sides. If someone says, no, I think people, coaches, schools should share their results, I can see totally the, re uh, the reasoning behind it. I just factor way more the, private, even if you're a coach, you know, and you say, I don't want to, I can say I'm a winning player. And if they just, then you need to accept the fact that some people won't believe it, you know, which in these days is normal, right? So you already have the, downsides and repercussions of someone not believing you if you don't want to share results if you're truly a winning player that's that's already a bit of like punishment enough of not being transparent um so but we never really cared about this i never really cared about this um if someone even now is like hey my shark scoop is locked why is your shark scoop locked like there are all sorts of conspiracy theories out there already and i was like i don't fucking care like then just don't sign up with us you know I will still want to decide when I keep something open and when I share something and when not. And this time I decided, hey, let me share a bit more, be a bit more transparent about my results. And uh, that's what you get. I mean, you see all the filters, everything from all sides. There's nothing hidden. There's nothing reset. Usually it would show, hey, this graph has been reset. I think it's also a great protective me mechanism that I only show my results from certain years and other years I've been down. You know, you can literally see there's no hidden filter, nothing selected, like we filtered for certain stakes and everything. And there's still people thinking, oh, it's uh, why do you have it closed? There must be something bad about it. You know, it's just, but this is what it is. You know, some people will always uh, think about the, um, see always the ghost under the, the bed, you know? Um, yeah. There is always the perceived scam, but that's all right. They want that gotcha moment. Like, what's he got to hide? What's going on here? It must, yeah. must be a huge loser, you know? Yeah, That's yeah. the great thing about Shark Scope versus Hendon Mob, which just shows caches compared to online. Shark Scope wins and losses shows a graph. And why don't we have this for our life yet? I don't. I really don't understand why we don't take the next step to just track. If, I mean, you can tr you track the buy-ins and you track the caches. Just, like, subtract it. Like, well, what's so difficult about it? I heard it's something to protect people that are big losers from it, it being out there or it not being public knowledge of what you buy in for, but it has to be public knowledge. It has to be tracked for what you cash for, for like tax purposes or back child support or just like people's privacy. I've, I've questioned this in the past and that was the answer I got from either Hendon Mob directly or someone very reputable where they could track your buy-ins, but they choose not to for some 
like privacy reason. But yeah, but I, you, you I, can you can decide, you can opt in. I think a lot of players would actually do that. You know, it's like um, same for Shark Scope. You don't have to, but true. the true winners that would probably appreciate the ones who don't like it. I I feel I find it weird, you know, just opt in and maybe give some some sort of incentive. You know, everyone who opts in, we have like yearly leaderboard, the top ten get certain rewards or extra benefits, maybe tournament buy-ins, you can make a cooperation with GG stars, ACR, whoever is powered by, you know, they throw in a little price pool, you give an incentive for people to opt in and sacrifice sacrifice their privacy. Because I see the privacy going in both directions. Now you protect the losers, but you're not protecting the winners because you have a lot of people. Um, I remember one friend of mine, wow, you already made 300K in life cashes. Wow, that's insane. It's like, no, that's actually really, really bad. If you don't have the perception, you know, it's like they play $10, $10 limits in their local casinos or $1 tournaments with their friends, you know, and then you see like 300, 400 K. It's like, wow, yeah, you, boy, that's insane. Like you probably play all these high rollers. It's like, no, I played like maybe 15 live tournaments in 10 years, you know, it's like, it's, it's really, I think also really bad for those who have a lot of cashes or general people because it doesn't put things into perspective. Yeah, it protects the losers, but doesn't protect the winners, winners either it's because you see these huge numbers. Yeah, I think it's just best to be transparent, but I, yeah. I see why even winning players want it blocked so their opponents don't know how good they are just to protect themselves. And, yeah, know, but they can, they can decide to be opted out like for that feature or function, you know, on Endemo. It's like, just say, I decide to opt out from my cash is being collected and then maybe at some sort of verification level, same as you have on Sharkscope, you know, you connect it with your, you have to verify yourself with your Hendemop account and then you can decide, opt in, opt out. I mean, we're in 2023, it shouldn't be that difficult, right? Yeah, that'd be a nice feature. Uh, we, should, we should hit up Hendemop and uh, get the ball rolling on this, maybe, uh, yeah. And like you said, align them with a poker site so they can promote it and get people on their site. Opens and, up, uh, yeah, sorry. Good. Yeah, no, that makes, that makes a lot of sense because there are paid ads on Sharkscope for people's, you know, websites and stuff. So yeah, they can get a, or even, uh, yeah, Sharkscope or Handed Mob do a collaboration with a site. That'd be pretty smart. Yeah, it opens doors for potential sponsorship revenue for the site, can offer better features, uh, maybe even add a premium level where you have access to more statistics, more data, um ad free you know also then they can increase the price pool um and then you can really get an accurate top 100 and we can really say these are currently the top five players you know um yeah. that'll be great i think something is missing and uh, you have it in every sport you know and then you can truly see who are the goats did did you have any like dress code or something like no sunglasses was there anything or can you just show up still in your joggers and sweater yeah. and, or hoodie uh, no, no, no dress, no dress code. Uh, not many people really wore. I don't think really anybody wore sunglasses. It was just a lot of uh, just mutually agreed upon standards of etiquette where everybody's on the same page. Everybody's having a good time. There's no disputes, no drama. Um, so everything's just taken care of. Uh, seamless registration process. Um, they just, the only thing I thought that, I mean, everything's positive until you think it's something negative. Uh, the only thing that was really strange to me was how often they're moving you as tables break or new tables form people. Yeah, red. that's true. Yeah. The most I've ever experienced like five, five plus times every tournament. It seemed like I got moved and okay. it's like, like almost once an hour, like, Oh, next big blind. You're going over here. Next big blind. You're going over here. But the really cool thing was on the Triton app, which I like showed you screenshots of. Yeah. They have someone on every single table with an iPad that updates the action on every single hand. Every hand is tracked, every sizing, every stack size, the player's name, their whole bio, all their caches. So going back to what I said about um, these guys interrogating me, trying to figure out who I am, they didn't need to. My, yeah. my legal name is right on the app. So they can just Google me or click on my name and see how many caches I had, previous hands I played, stack size dif difference. It's just a great app that you can have open like mid hand. So you don't have to ask everybody, Hey, can I see your stack? You know, how many chips you got? It's right there on the app updated every single hand, which is just crazy to have someone at every table always updating that. Yeah. So just a great feature. I wish more venues would do that, but I understand that 
it's such a high cost for especially for yeah for yeah but i remember it's so great for fans to sweat the action it's yeah. that's what it needs sometimes some I, other events i would like look updates and then you have to click through multiple pages until you get to a chip count up then it's also 30 minutes delay and yeah it's pretty good it's pretty clean and very user friendly i love it yeah, I had a lot of friends sweating me just yeah like every single hand they can see i shoved all in everybody folded all right yeah i went to showdown with this i made a big hero call you can see everything so maybe venues can implement this at like maybe the final five or final 10 tables if they can em employ someone to stand there with an ipad and just input the action every single hand and yeah. they really got it wrong like a lot i'm not going to say any names but a lot of other uh, hand reporting companies and these hand histories are just garbage Mm -hmm. like it doesn't even make sense like yeah you're blind 5k 10k jeff opens for 250k it's like what <laughs> no i didn't, didn't open for 25x and then someone someone min raises and jeff folds i'm like what this didn't happen so i really appreciate the accuracy and just that app is super valuable yeah um, i wish other companies could could do that yeah did you have any big hand from the tournament apart from the 10-10 hand, a big hero call or a big bluff or what was the most spectacular hand? Uh, there was a couple definitely on the 50K. Um, I made the cardinal sin of the double the double whammy. I, <laughs> I pulled a big triple barrel bluff on to call, to call to, Talal Shakurchi. And like they say, don't bluff a billionaire. I... I figured next level, he'd assume I wouldn't want to bluff a billionaire. So therefore I should do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I just called a top pair. He didn't care at all. <laughs> didn't didn't uh, work out. No. And yeah, I hit a big draw. Could have checked the river, but I was like, yeah, 10 high is not going to win. But I, I did block a lot of the draws that missed. So probably, probably better to check. And oh, a ten, bluff, bluffing 10 high draws don't seem too bad. So it seems fine to me without yeah, knowing the like, exact well, action. I check, I lose. Or oh, did you go all in on the river or how big was the pot? No, it was early. It was early. We were deep. Um, okay. So, yeah, just like a, you know, 60% river bet. But, uh, and then there was like another unknown, maybe like 21-year-old Asian, looked like a like a gambler of some sort. Just looked like he had that, that gamble flare in his eye. Um, <laughs> uh, he raised and I three bet kings and the flop came down uh, seven, four, three. And like part of me is like, oh, this this is probably a range check. But then other part of me is like, come on, idiot, you got an overpair, just bet, <laughs> you know, protect yeah. your hand. But then I was like, yeah, I'll just check it, you know, check call, keep them honest. And I check called, and then the turn came like a 10. And I checked again and he bet real big. And I was like, man, this guy's got a set. I just 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 this live read. I'm just like, this guy's just got a fucking set. And I didn't want to just get in a hundred blinds with kings like first level or 150 blinds because i'd have to call the river and i just tank folded and i was like show me one and he showed me a five so I, i'm pretty sure he had a five six for the straight just like by the way he showed it so i might have been wrong but it, it makes the most sense that he actually flopped the straight so i was pretty happy that i mean it's only ace five or six five right i mean you're blocking vice yeah. suited right so it's like to call my big three bet and a seven four three um ten i think the return was a ten ten or nine and I'm just like, what does he put me on? So yeah, just bluffing the billionaire and fold into the, the young Asian gambler, uh, just things you shouldn't normally do, but in the moment it just felt right. And it just yeah. didn't work out, you know? So many decisions are, you know, you can't really be too results oriented with a sample size of one. <laughs> just, um, and I, yeah. I just like lost half my stack in the 50K on those two hands. Yeah. The good thing though also is, is if a bluff is shown that the other is on the table, because usually when you place big bets on the river, you should do it for value. You should do it with good hands. And what most people, when they're too afraid of bluffing is, if you're someone who has the image of being too tight and passive, you're not being paid out for your good hands. And then you're going to be in trouble. And that can really kill your win rate. Um, there are also a lot of wrecks and high stakes where it's known they're not bluffing enough and you can just constantly fold. Um, I think in general, it's really hard for most players to find enough bluffs in many spots. Like if you look into some of the solvers, it's crazy what hands you're supposed to bluff with. Um, 
But if you really have this nitty and passive image, you're really going to struggle uh, unless you're playing some really super soft games where you should be playing that image. But if you now play in games like Triton or online mid stakes, high stakes, where the pool gets smaller and smaller and people start developing reads on you, or that situation with Talal, like, yeah, this bluff might have gone wrong, but... You know, I always think like, all right, now my opponents know I can triple barrel bluff because most of the time I have it, you know, and that's good. It's also good for your future EV that, all right, you know, you're being labeled as, uh, I, I've seen a triple barrel bluff from him. Even if you're not bluffing all the frequencies you're supposed to, you know, you might still be under bluffing, but you always get caught by their, by their bluff catchers. If they start falling bluff catchers they're supposed to call, it's actually pretty bad for you. If if you're not over bluffing, most players are not over, over bluffing. But if someone really starts falling all these bluff catches against you, and you're not over bluffing, that's actually he's exploiting you. So if I see these calls, I'm like, all right, cool. They keep calling against me. And this is like once once you start shifting that mental, it's like, all right, here and there, like having these bluffs. You know, even if there's a, if you're supposed to bluff, uh, and it's a GTO bluff, and maybe you know King and Pawns are not folding, it's like. I'm always advocating to not like find these stupid bluffs, but here and there you should uh, do reasonable smart bluffs, even if the triple bar, check race river, you know, it's like your opponents label you as he can find these bluffs and they will pay you out. And that's great. Yeah, I, I did get some feedback. I was eating dinner with a guy who was at the table later and, or, uh, and he said, when you fired that big bet on the river against Talal, I thought you had it. <laughs> for what it's worth i was like oh well at least i didn't give anything away like yeah. alive yeah big thing people don't being able to compose yourself and just not give anything away like on the surface or like someone gets a sixth sense they give you they get that live read they check your breathing your pulse your mannerisms there's so much you can give away live i was just happy i was able to you know stay consistent with my betting and sizing and just overall demeanor at the table that i didn't really give anything away and it, it could have worked in theory. It just just didn't. <laughs> and just like I said, the meta game of if he thinks I'm, you know, scared money satellite winner, I'm it's probably less likely I'm going to be bluffing. So he should fold. But he, that day he just didn't care, and he ended up winning the uh, the hundred k main event later on for three million. So uh, good job, Talal. Nice guy. Yeah, he's a legend, man. And I think he's very underrated. Uh, he's also constantly running deep in all of the main events, scoop main, W coop main, and all these big tourneys uh, over and over again. Um, so yeah, big yeah, respect for him. Splash. He, he likes to splash more than I uh, anticipated from some of the things I saw. But uh, you know, it, you live and learn, and um, yeah, just a great experience overall at Triton. And can't wait to go back. I got another shot at uh, Cyprus, so. Yeah, what's what's that. happening there now? What are your plans? Tell tell me a little, tell us a little bit more about the the current challenge with the ACR Stormers. Uh, well, yeah, the um, ACR uh, Phil decided to send uh, two more site pros and one Stormer to Cyprus, which is in uh, May 10th mm -hmm. through 25th. Another great destination and um, another another schedule of high roller tournaments. So we're going to do another competition between the 12 ACR pros. It's already been running for nine days now where you get different points for uh, your top 10 online or live caches with a multiplier. Okay. It's just the number of buy-ins. So mm -hmm. $50 tournament, $55 tournament, you win $550. That's a 10X multiplier. You want 10 buy-ins. So your top 10 scores in terms of buy-ins. So mm -hmm. um, minimum buy-in, $11, no maximum buy-in. And live tournaments get a 5X multiplier because it's so, like so much more time and effort yeah. compared to the volume you can put on online um and i've been doing pretty good i got a couple 70 x's already and just gotta grind all month long until april 30th just non-stop and try to get my 10 best scores for that part of the, the, the of the segment um the other part is heads up 16 uh 16 total people i think 12 pros and four other people are going to be in this heads up competition you get points for going deep in that and the last part is two different social media aspects. Number of followers gained on Twitter, number of followers gained on Instagram, and percentage of followers gained. So if I have 10,000 followers and I gain 1,000, that's a 10% increase. So if another pro okay. only has like 1,000 followers, it's kind of the same increase. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's weighted. And 
Um, there's also gonna be a panel judging the quality of our best uh, five or 10 posts, I believe. So your the creativity um, is very important, not only in, you know, you, you can't just be post a bunch of garbage and hope to get followers. I mean, there's strategy behind that, I'm sure. But the, the ACR panel is gonna judge who had the best post, not only just promoting ACR, but in general, whether they're, you know, funny, um, emotional, something moving, something that gets a lot of interaction. That's just a quality post on social media, which is filled with, you know, tons of toxic stuff. So if you can do something good and be creative and original, they're going to really value that and get points for that. So four categories, online and live, social media following, uh, social media quality, social media quality, and heads up. So if you guys don't follow me on Instagram, I am Jeff Boski Poker on Instagram, and I am I-C-U-R-A Rook on Twitter. But if you just type in Jeff Boski, it will come up. We, we, so, put, we put everything in here in the description as well. So yeah, go follow this guy, support him. He deserves to win another package. He's putting in the hours. He's putting in the work. He's putting in the dedication. Great guys there in ACR, like doing great promotion. I, I love it. That's that's how yeah. it's supposed to be. Creative, engaging the streamers, engaging your partners, and not just oh here give tickets to our streamers, let them play events, let them work a little bit for their money. You know, um, it's it's a great challenge, and it's it's worth it. It's huge budgets they're they're putting in there, and um, I think this is also how it's supposed to be. You know, I think every poker player has one day dreams of being a partner pro, becoming a pro for for a site. I remember back then like a lot of. My friends were like, I would be cool to be a pro for one of the sides, you know, you get some extra money, promotions, whatever. But that's a fantastic way because it's not just, hey, the step of becoming a, a sponsored pro, but now also playing in the biggest events of the like the next ladder or the next step on uh, reaching the ultimate heights in, in, in poker, live poker, playing against all these legends for 20, 50, 100,000 buy-ins and like millions in prize pool. It's absolutely fantastic. And I think that's also how you create a good relationship with the streamers, right? Because you connect that you have gotten this opportunity in the first place with that side and not just this, all right, we hire a streamer, give them a little bit of budget, give them some buy-ins, let them stream a little bit, that's it, move on next, you know, and then cancel the contract after a year or two years after the hype is gone. Like, this is how I feel like it goes with a lot of sites, but um, great to see. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, Phil's real big about just the experience, you know, doing something different, something memorable. Mm -hmm. And um, he, he really wants us to be in, in the spotlight, not only for the brand, but for our own, you know, our own memory, our own, yeah. uh, the opportunity of going to these events that we wouldn't normally ever even think about going. Like I would, I would never just be like, oh, I'm going to sell 100, 200K in, in action and go to yeah. Cyprus. But he, they present us the opportunity. Two pros are going to go this time. And I'm going to be working 15 hour days for the next month, grinding online and socials to uh, try to be top two. Nice. So it's going to be a hell of a journey, win or lose. And I just uh, appreciate the free roll. I mean, can't turn that down. Got to give it my all. That's going to be interesting in May then with Triton going on. And I think the scoop and also spring championship on GG should start at some point. Oh. So I don't mind everyone going to Triton makes online softer. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, these, these fields are every i mean almost every top pro just packed i mean there are some asian, asian businessmen but they're not bad they, they know how to play they're, yeah. they're very very tough fields but i enjoy the competition and it really really puts you to the test you know just yeah. knowing what these people are capable of and really earning the victory not just winning some random tournament with a bunch of bunch of average players you're playing against the best at the the highest stakes and just a great great experience and um just, just got to get back on that grind and uh, do my best. What are your What are your plans then now for the next week? I guess just locked in and grinding, right? Like nothing else. Speak. Tell us a little bit about your routines. Like how usually does a day in uh, Jeff Bowski's life look like? When uh, are you getting up? What is it that you do? Pretty Pretty structured now. I, I knew I had to have a plan. What Pretty much what I did last um, for the uh, Vietnam contest was um, just wake up early. Um, in that one, it was different because the tournaments were just five micros, like $5 tournaments throughout the day, real spread out. So you had to just play all day. Yeah. Um, just these micros just try to do well. Now it's any tournament or any live tournament. So you got a little more flexibility, okay. but 
you can also go harder because you can just play tons of big field tournaments because you really want to focus on big fields so you yeah. get the big multi. Uh, that's the strategy. Uh, I wake up now, uh, seven o'clock every day. I'm out the door at seven thirty or eight to go to the gym. Uh, minimum one hour at the gym. Come home, eat, shower, walk the dogs, get online, nice, and just grind online from say ten o'clock to until there's just no more tournaments to reg. I mean, we're talking, we're talking midnight. You know, I'm yeah probably twelve to fourteen hours of online play every day. I did finally play live yesterday. There was a four hundred dollar tournament at the win, um, and I uh, soft bubbled at uh, twelve thirty at night. But, that sucks. Uh, yeah, ace, ace king to aces. Uh, yeah. Guess I could have folded. <laughs> <laughs> that sucks. That sucks. And Boski, uh, yeah, that's uh, for how long? For me, how many more weeks does it going on? That's that sounds like a tough grind, man. Uh, especially yeah, you know we're approaching the forties. You know we're not the twenty two years old anymore. <laughs> yeah, but luckily I've had the experience. I've uh, this isn't really anything new. Just kind of pushing my limits a little bit farther. I've been you know I played. 50,000 tournaments on stars, 20,000 tournaments on ACR in the past five years. So multi-tabling MTTs, not, not that big of a deal. I just have to adjust my strategy where I gamble a lot more during the re-entry period where I'm, I'm probably even losing in these fields now because I'm gambling so hard with mm. uh, trying to build stacks in the re-entry to give myself a better shot of final yeah. tabling or winning. I think that's the best strategy. I mean, I, I told myself I'm down to lose 20K in tournaments over yeah. the next month. If, if need be, if, if that happens, I, I can't be bad. Yeah. Um, it's just a necessary investment for a chance to win a hundred K plus. Um, That's package. hard. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it ends April 30th. So I'll be online every single day or playing online while I'm playing live at the wind. They have a series going on. Um, you can play on the tablet now um, for ACR as well. So I, I do that. Got to be maximum uh, efficiency. Uh, yeah, great, top. great, 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 great. Man, you deserve it. You grind it like uh, Jeff. So guys, go check the comments or description. Follow on the socials so he gains more followers. Um, that's a guy we want to represent poker. So best of luck for that. You certainly deserve it. And uh, thanks for coming on here today. It was a... Uh, real gem listening to that high roll experience in Triton and I hope you guys enjoyed it as well if you do have another question feel free to drop one in the comments I'm pretty sure Bolski will keep an eye on that and uh, respond if there are more questions coming up that we haven't covered here um, we certainly don't want to do more things in the future maybe I join his stream for a review or we do some other epic shit together so Bolski thank you so much for joining us here today Thank you, Ben. It's been a pleasure to be an affiliate for ACR for all these years. Love watching you stream every Sunday or every almost every Sunday on uh, Twitch and always appreciate those big boy raids you send my way. Much appreciated. And it's uh, great to be part of, part of the Raise Your Edge community. Happy to have you on board. Best of luck for your journey. And guys, don't forget to like, like and subscribe. We're almost hitting the 100K. Maybe we hit the 100K already when this podcast goes live. See you guys uh, and uh, best of luck on the tables and stay strong. Thank you, Ben.